Picture fields of enormous mammals, far bigger than those we have today. Imagine the unimaginably daunting task it would be to face these terrifying beasts and take them down. You definitely need quite the motivation to do this. And that motivation was there. Hunger. Our ancestors were so driven by this hunger that they proceeded to eat a plethora of megafauna out of existence and passed their time casually eating entire herds of woolly mammoths until there were none left. Facing massive woolly rhinoceros, 11 foot tall bears that undoubtedly clashed with us over kills, massive camels the size of elephants, and elephants bigger than even the mammoths were, were all on the menu. What an incredible appetite they must have had to take on such intimidating foes. What courage they must have had to attack creatures that could kill them with a single stomp. But they did, and they were so successful in their hunts that they managed to wipe out almost all of their food. The plains were no longer filled with giant beasts, and humans had to do what they do best, adapt once again. Humans had, in essence, become the next great extinction in this part of the world and had so effectively hunted their food that they wiped out these remarkable beasts. In fact, gigantic elephants living in the Middle East, lions living in Europe, and giant horse orangutan looking things living in Europe not too long ago may sound unbelievable to the average person, but we removed all of these species from these lands, along with the help of climate change and the end of the last ice age. Yes, the ice age ending did play a big role, but we were definitely the primary reason for such a fast and thorough extinction. Humans now faced an incredible challenge. Their primary food that they had subsisted off for hundreds of thousands of years was mostly gone now. And now they needed to come up with something new to survive. With almost no other options available to them, they began what we now know as farming. Humans took something that was hardly satiating and changed them into something that could actually sustain us. This was no short and simple process and took eons to achieve, along which humans suffered and fell victim to malnutrition and starvation regularly. In fact, when we analyze the skeletons from this period, there is a massive drop down in height, and we see most groups becoming around two inches shorter on average. Our ancestors' new diet had devastating effects on them. Brain sizes shrunk, bones weakened, and a host of diseases, previously fairly uncommon, had become a regular occurrence now. This new diet was clearly an ill-fitting one for Homo sapiens. But what choice did they have? At this point, humans had to make do with what they had and subside off these new crops they had began to domesticate. So what were these original plants? Wheat, for one, was a combination of two wild grasses, emma grass and goat grass, which interbred and made wheat. But this original wheat was far smaller and less nutrient rich than our modern day wheat. In fact, all grains come from grassy plants and follow the same story of being small and hardly edible when compared to today's varieties. What about the vegetables? The brassica family takes the cake when it comes to demonstrating the massive transformation we caused in these plants. Look at all the different species we created from just this one plant. Each variety was us swelling and enhancing different parts of the plant 
to make it bigger and more nutrient rich. Carrots were these fibrous roots. Eggplants looked like this. Tomatoes looked like tiny little berries. Chilies looked like this tiny little thing. Cucumbers looked like this, and the list goes on. One would need to ask themselves, how much could these early versions of these crops really meet our calorific needs? Fruit wasn't much better, and here is an example of bananas before domestication, of which we spoke about before. Here is watermelons, not in prehistoric times, but only just a few hundred years ago. This painting from the 1700s shows just how much we have changed these fruits only in the last 300 years. Now imagine all the fruits we had 1,000, 2,000, 50,000 years ago. Apples, pineapples, and peaches all looked like something you'd hardly want to eat as a prehistoric human who was in dire need of calories. They were ridiculously small compared to their modern counterparts and had fibrous textures without the huge pieces of soft, delicious flesh that we so gladly enjoy today. They contained around 50 times less sugar in some cases and in general, they were at least five times less sugary than what we have today. These juicy, sugar-filled sweet treats we have today are not what nature designed in any way. In fact, a simple understanding of the energy and nutrient requirements to make these comparatively giant masses of sugar and nutrients for these plants doesn't make sense evolutionarily at all. The reason fruits exist is an ingenious scheme plants have to manipulate creatures into taking the seeds from the plant and to transport them to a new location. In return, the animals are rewarded with nutrients and energy to sustain them. This amount would only need to be just enough to attract these animals to do this, and nothing more. Making giant fruits with exorbitant, expensive energy costs makes no sense for these plants, and it's like selling lemonade for a dollar a bottle and adding gold flakes into it. We went through extraordinary lengths to change these plants into what they are today, and using line breeding and crossbreeding managed to create this modern diet we are now able to enjoy. Thousands, maybe millions of our ancestors died and suffered terrible fates along the way while patiently waiting for these plants to become better and more nutrient dense. The transition into farming and subsiding off of these plants must have been very difficult and these brave humans survived on what little nutrients they could attain from these primitive plant sources before they were fully domesticated. Of course, they were assisted by the domestication of animals along the way, which largely kept them alive in most cases through supplementation of animal foods. Just barely though, a lot of the time. It would be a shame for us to naively believe that these plants have always just existed and we would be forgetting the tremendous sacrifice they made for us. You see, the paleo diet is all just wrong. How can we truly say that it's a paleolithic diet when it contains all these foods that weren't around during the time? This is not me just being a nerd and aiming for historical accuracy. This is also a factor in terms of the health effects of the diet. What are they 
And what is the closest diet to our original diet? Before getting into the third part of our series and what we'll talk about there, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Wondering how much Neanderthal DNA you have? Tommy Jen has generously decided to give my viewers a 10% discount on their DNA tests. This is one of the few DNA tests that shows the amount of Neanderthal DNA you have. Being one of the most comprehensive DNA tests out there, they also offer tons of super interesting info relating to your genetic code and can tell you about your paternal and maternal haplogroups, as well as health, pharmacological and nutritional information unique to your DNA. Click the link below and use my coupon Archives of ECNI to get your 10% discount. Anyway, without further ado, let's get back to the video. In the third part of this series, I will explain some of the health implications we are facing due to our modern diet and the possible rectifications we can make to our paleo diet classification. We can truly see what the real paleo diet should be.